Hi, I'm Phil Noble with Envision South Carolina, and we're here at the Greenville University Center uh, talking with former governor and <coughs> former secretary of education, Dick Riley, the, um, the elder statesman of our state, sure. and a, a great one at that. Um, thank you for doing this. Uh, My pleasure. Let's <laughs> talk a little bit about, I mean, you grew up here, your family's been upstate forever uh, in South Carolina. When did you first begin to have some sort of consciousness about South Carolina being different or unusual or a special place? Was it when you went off in, in the service or was it earlier? What, what were the sort of early experiences that made you conscious of, of we as the people of South Carolina? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, <clears throat> I think a lot of times I get a lot of questions about about my formative years and how I developed my involvement in leadership and so forth. <clears throat> and, and in that regard, I, I usually uh, fall back on my father was an officer in the Navy. We lived in Miami for four years and came back to South Carolina. And I was in like the seventh grade at Greenville Middle School, then junior high school. And the first time I ever got involved in, in a leadership way is I got involved in a declamation contest there. <clears throat> it was a big deal, the McManus Declamation Award and the places it was packed. I got into finals, the final 10. I was a young guy, didn't have a whole lot of friends back in Greenville with nine other people who were very popular, very well known or whatever. So I drew number 10. So I was gonna be the last speaker in this big event. And I sat there on the stage, and everybody was hollering for their various <laughs> friends or whatever. And I said, you know, if I'm going to do something, I've really got to give this thing a good lick. And so I <clears throat> kind of in my own mind got up and really laid this declamation out. I remember the, the, <clears throat> it was the, the first line was, I am a refugee. It was about somebody who had just come to this country and what all they found. And I got a little off in the middle of it, but I did on my own for a while, and I got back into it. So I finished, and I got this great standing ovation, and I won the declamation contest. And people asked me, said, when did you first decide to become a leader? What I said, right. I think that had something to do with it. I really felt from that on that if I really put myself into something, I could do something with it. In South Carolina, of course, uh, I grew up here in Greenville, and uh, other than those years uh, with my father in Miami. Uh, then I was in the Navy for two years, and of course in law school and so forth, and then uh, ran for the House as a very young guy in my 20s, and served four years there and then 10 in the Senate. And during that period, I mean, I really got to know South Carolina pretty well. I was a reformer in the Senate. I ran for governor, was a long shot. Really went out across the state. I headed up Jimmy Carter's campaign for president, and he was selected for this state. And uh, <clears throat> I really b began to realize uh, what a wonderful state it is. It's a great size to start with. What are we, about <clears throat> four and 4.8 million, almost five million. Uh, the geography's good. Uh, We've got three big uh, urban areas, so South Carolina, and then we've got, they're connected to Greenville, Spartanburg, and Columbia, Lexington, and Charleston, and North Charleston, and then these great middle-sized communities, uh, Rock Hill, and Anderson, and on around Florence, and Orangeburg, and, and so forth, Aiken, Sumter, whatever. Really is a, is a great place, and we have the small rural communities. We have like uh, almost 30% uh, African American citizens in the state. <clears throat> Education has been my big thing. I, ever since I got into then government, uh, I really wanted to make a move on education. It was clear to me that if we were gonna have a, a future in this state, we had to pull out of our past, change our culture really about how we looked uh, <clears throat> at our state, it looked at, our, at each other. Uh, to, to really uh, take the, the community that had been discriminated against for years, uh, and, and we were doing so much better with it. One time, women were in that same uh, category. 
so much better over the years, but boy, we still had a long way to go. And there was still this, this lingering uh, subculture thing that we were pulling out of over the years. Uh, and, and that really ha has something to do with the makeup of the state. As I say, we're moving in the right direction. I think all of the pushing is in the right direction now. Uh, but I <clears throat> really feel uh, heavy when I think about what has happened to the black population in South Carolina, not necessarily right now, but over the years. And I do think the makeup, the, the uh, culture of the state right now uh, is not centered on that, but it's underneath. And it is a, a pull on us to do something about it, and I want to do that. You, you talked about the EIA Education Improvement Act as being a cultural shift, a cultural change in this state. Talk more about that and how, how you made that cultural change and how we can apply that to the challenges we've got now. Well, of course, education is, is to me, the answer to all of our needs for the future. Uh, and, and education then is, is where I felt like we should make our, our real move. The Education Improvement Act, uh, of course, we were the lowest uh, support monetarily for education uh, <clears throat> of any state, I think, other than Mississippi. And uh, we had to have more money in the system. We had to have the system run well. We had to have a lot of conservative views that we weren't throwing money away, but we were very careful about it. And I had all those views. And um, it was a people's movement, and I, I was very proud of that. I, I really moved then, since I could not do but so much in, in the legislature, because it was controversial. Uh, Senate less than House, but the House uh, money bill had to emanate in the House. And so we had to win the House, uh, and that was very difficult. And when I analyzed it carefully over a number of months, I had like, 23 people in the House out of 124 that were really committed to education. 23 out of 124 that were committed. That's all I could get, and they were called, the press called them the Smurfs because they were little people. They I remember were, that. They were not the speaker, they the were not Smurfs. the chairman I'd of the committee. I'd forgotten that. So they, but they were a committed little group, and, uh, and they were fighters, and they knew how to count, and they knew how to work. And uh, so we came forward really with the people. Uh, meetings all over the state, uh, as you recall. We had, I went on state television two or three times, and, and what we really got out of the legislature into the public domain, and it was very well received. Uh, and, and the people really kind of rose up. Uh, every legislator had a stack of calls in their hand, people back home calling them. The halls were full of people all the time. Uh, and finally, we picked up more and more and more, and we finally got it done. <clears throat> and the people felt very good about themselves. Uh, all people, black, white, rich, poor, uh, people in private schools, people in colleges and universities. We, we, we came, we, we funded higher education during that period better than we had ever had before. You funded higher education? Higher education, to show you how if people get into education, get supportive of it, they support all levels of education, even private education, that's true. Schools, that's a, whatever. That's a very interesting observation. <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that changed, uh, in my judgment, Phil, uh, the way people felt about themselves. And we had a major commitment for education. And I did a lot of work around in other countries and across this country uh, to try to bring industry here to try to really build a state up. And I'll tell you what people, the top leaders in Europe or Asia or wherever, <clears throat> we were not at the very top in test scores. We were coming up from the bottom. After the EIA, we pulled up enormously fast. Um, what they were interested in is, is what was our commitment to education. What, where did we think we were going in the future? The past, yeah, we had some troubles in the past. We were correcting those. We had a real people's movement, black and white together for education, and, uh, and we had a commitment, and that's what they liked. 
Uh, that's what they wanted to know. They didn't ask me what our test scores were. That, they were concerned about it, I'm sure. But they wanted to know what, what was our commitment. And I clearly was committed to quality public schools for all children. You, you, you said that when people got involved with, with it, they felt better about themselves. Talk, I mean, how, it, 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 and it's, it's a whole empowering strategy as opposed to, you know, just banging heads in the legislature. I remember I read their oral history with Jack Bass about that brilliant piece of work. Um, but, but it was very clear that you, you basically just set aside the legislature and went out and rallied public support. And, and you say people felt better about themselves for being engaged in that. Talk, I mean, are there, do you remember some manifestations of that or? Well, one thing, uh, while it was going on and after the EIA was passed, <coughs> PTAs were full. You had to get to a PTA meeting early to get a seat. Yeah. Uh, before that, very <coughs> half empty uh, PTA right. room. And, and it's amazing, you can see, because the people felt like it was, it was their movement and, and they liked it. And they wanted to be part of their children's education. And they wanted to see their children do better and have a better chance, have a better opportunity. And, uh, and I really, got the sense that the people uh, really felt like, yes, we passed a major piece of legislation, and, and the major people right. said it was the most effective of all the 50 states. Right. But really, uh, more than that, we had the, the people with this feeling that, that, number one, they had done it, and number two, it was going to make a difference for all children. Right. And it really had a, an effect of pulling people together for all children. Are the lessons of that still applicable today? I mean, it is, is major change and reform, it, is it still the EIA model? Bypass the quote leaders and go to the grassroots and build from there. Is that still a valid model in this day and age of the internet and people connected and distracted? Or is that, or is that a wonderful days of bygone democracy, or, or is it still a viable model, do you think? Well, it's, it's a model that really uh, <coughs> is, is a movement. Uh, it's awful difficult to, uh, to develop a movement, uh, and it takes a lot of people. It takes uh, leadership, but it takes a, a lot of good, good factors. And I think it's about time for a movement of that kind. Uh, the thing that I've been so interested in involved, and involved with, uh, the Riley Institute at Furman University that I'm very much involved with, uh, has a great program called the Diversity Leadership Initiative. Juan Johnson, uh, who's an African American from Atlanta, came, is here, very much involved with, he's on Furman's board now. And uh, we have all of our alumni, uh, 400, 500 people, uh, meet once a year, and, and the topic we meet on is one South Carolina. That is what I think perhaps could be the next uh, movement. Uh, it involves the word diversity. Uh, I would like to see South Carolina uh, become a garden of diversity to where people from other states, people from other countries said, you know, here's a small state, 30% uh, black, 6% Hispanic or whatever, uh, whatever it is, they are one state. And they're all working together. They believe in each other. They want to help each other. It's not us and them. Uh, that to me is more important. I'm a, a loyal Democrat, but that's more important right. to me than the party. Uh, it's more important to me than uh, any of my other personal views. Uh, that if we can have all the people working together, and yes, education is a part of that. Uh, becoming educated about the importance of diversity for one thing, but to learn together, to work together, to teach together, all of those things involving education and improving the people of the state. How does <coughs> the rest of the country and the world view South Carolina? What do they think of us? 
Well, we've had um, a number of things that, that have not been fortunate in terms of, of the world view of the state view over the last several years. And uh, <clears throat> that I don't, I don't say preoccupied with that, <clears throat> but it, it is a fact. Most people <clears throat> that know the state love to come here. Uh, they love to come here for uh, vacation, for as tourists. Uh, they love to come here to do business. South Carolina has a very strong reputation for being pro-business, and that's something I support too. <clears throat> I also support pro-jobs and pro-opportunities for people. And I think the people in this state do. Uh, <clears throat> most of the business communities in all these various communities I mentioned across the state, they're usually very progressive. Uh, and they support quality schools in their community. They support uh, hospitals and, and health care. They support justice uh, and, and law enforcement and safety. Uh, you see that kind of thing happening all across the state. Now, as a state, uh, we do get some publicity that people laugh about things that have happened to this person or that person and uh, walking in the Appalachian right. Mountains when we're right. in uh, right. South America or whatever right. and, and they smile and laugh when I say I'm from South Carolina and, and that's all right that doesn't bother me <clears throat> but it it does make you want to have people when they say South Carolina people say you know that is a place that's special and why is it special? One is they're committed to education in a very serious way. And I do think that would take another movement to, to move there. And the other is diversity, that this is a state where the people know how to work together, to live together, to be together, and to provide this state uh, with the kind of future that we all want. In, in terms of the, the hallmarks, the, the, the message that you think we can deliver to the world to transcend the problems is if we are the state that is in some ways leading in education and leading in the issues of diversity. To me, that would be ideal. And uh, Phil, that touches everything else. I mean, that touches character. It touches values. Uh, it touches uh, competence. It touches all of the other important aspects uh, of life, uh, in my judgment. Uh, South Carolina ha is, is a very uh, interested in, in religion and to the spiritual things, and that's a part of our, our state. And that also can be part of this effort, <clears throat> and, and I would love to see that. I, and you think of, uh, of politics. My father was chairman of the Democratic Party, when Jack Kennedy ran. So he was right. Jack Kennedy's uh, chairman. He, Fritz Hollins was a close friend of Kennedy's. <clears throat> and I went around with him to, to make a lot of speeches or whatever, speaking for Kennedy. The big issue then was his Catholicism. Right. That was the big issue. That's everywhere you heard. They were talking about Rome. They were talking about the Pope. And really and now so many Catholics have come into the state and a very positive influence on the state. Uh, and you never, ever hear that. You know, that's done. Right. Uh, but back then, it's, it, that hadn't been that long ago. Right. Uh, that was the big issue in South Carolina. And, and we need to get over those kind of humps, uh, race, religion, uh, culture, all of those things, and really come together as one people, and that's what I'd like to see us do, and do it with education. Well, if, if education and the diversity, I mean, there's sort of in some sense two sides of the same coin, or at least related. Mm -hmm. What are the barriers to our being able to do that? I mean, are they, are they institutional, are they historic, or, or is it, you know, the legislature, is it the lack of leadership in local level, is it our character of sort of hat in hand mentality? What, what are the barriers to overcome? <clears throat> well, I think the, the, the one big barrier is, uh, is we are a conservative state, and I'm conservative Democrat. Uh, <clears throat> we have very difficult time turning loose the past. We perceive that to be a conservative thing, and it can be in many ways looked at as conservative, not wanting to change. Uh, but I think that's, that's it's a seat of, of any difficulties we have in, in moving us forward as, as one people. 
Uh, and I would like to see, uh, see that change. But, but that's typical generally of South Carolinians that we uh, love where we are, we love what we're doing, we love our families, our communities, but we kind of reach into the past uh, to pull that forward when we ought to be changing some things, not everything. Sure. A lot of things of the past are great. Uh, and as I say, we've had so many peaks in our history, and then we've had some valleys. Well, we don't need to hold on to those valleys and pull them into the present and the future. Is it a mindset? I mean, is, is this all just about South Carolina's historic cultural mindset that we've got to overcome? Well, yeah, that's hard to say. Uh, of course, everybody's different, and, uh, <clears throat> and I believe in those differences. I, and I love differences. I like people to be different, uh, but still into e helping to each right. other and interested in each other. <clears throat> and I don't think we have some kind of state mindset uh, as that, and I might not be describing that accurately, certainly not, because it's so different from person to person. But I do think uh, we are inclined as a state <clears throat> to thinking that it's conservative, basically, uh, to hold on to the past. And as I said, some of that past we don't need to hold on to. A lot of it we do, but some of it we don't. I have this sort of theory that in South Carolina, this, the, the prime political virtue, so to speak, is not really conservatism, but it's independence. But what has happened is, the, is over the last generation of, of Republican leadership, they've essentially managed it to combine conservatism and independence together. But if you look at, for example, if you look at the governors who've gotten elected starting in 74 and 80 and Carroll County, there, there were always governors who ran against the system. There were always the outsiders. Uh, one or two exceptions, I mean, you know, but, but by and large, the politics of South Carolina on the governor's level have been governors who ran against the status quo, Democrat or Republican. You know, is that a valid, is that a valid assessment? Well, I think uh, change is always good politics. <clears throat> you don't have to define what it's going to be, but we're going to do it differently. People like that. Um, liberals like it, conservatives, whatever. The, uh, <clears throat> I've always recognized that this state had a very independent uh, flow through it. Uh, and, yeah. and I was perceived as, as a Democrat, but an independent thinker. And, right. and I, I'm proud of that. I'm, I'm not ashamed of that at all. And I think that's, uh, that's good for the state. But you do have to come together uh, and form a government, and then you have to govern. But in the political era, when, when governors are running or members of the House or Senate or U.S. Senate or whatever, this idea of being a change agent, independent, is generally popular in South Carolina across the board. Everybody claims that they're going to represent change, that they're going to represent independence. Then on top of that is conservative, liberal, other ideologies that uh, generally this state is independent and conservative, but we have a strong number of uh, people who are on the liberal side, on, on the left, and then others, uh, the majority, I'm sure, on the right. Probably the majority is somewhere in the middle, in the middle, right middle, and left middle, but in the middle. That's where the independents are. And, and that's generally probably more right middle than left middle. In essence, what it, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but change and reform trumps left and right. I think it does. I think it does. I think people are inclined to be <clears throat> liberal in a good sense of the word, and that is they won't want government to get into improving things and they're into improvement and whatever. Conservatives generally want to right. hold government down and that kind of thing. So you get into those interplays into politics. Then you have an issue come up. It always amazes me. Uh, conservatism in the environmental world 
<coughs> is perceived to be right. liberal. Right. And, you know, and you, you try to understand all that, and you get right. confused by all the, the terms. But to conserve our wonderful environment, and South Carolina is blessed with a beautiful, beautiful environment. And that ought to be a real part of this coming together. Diversity of people, but let's all support our, our natural environment and so forth. And that is a conservative concept, <clears throat> and yet when you get into doing things to preserve the environment, people perceive that to be liberal. So you have that confusion. You always will have. It'll be a confusion right on. But we do have a kind of an independent spirit through the, throughout the history of this state that's still there. But you have to realize <clears throat> this state has loads of people who are not native South Carolinians. I don't know what the majority is here, there, and yonder, but a large, large percentage of the people came in here from other places, other right. countries, uh, other states, way off, North Carolina, Georgia, whatever. Uh, and it's amazing how many people that make up this state uh, are not native South Carolinians. The first time I ran for the House was in 1962. And I was a young guy just back from the Navy and whatever. <clears throat> and I had, it was my campaign slogan, I had zero money, was a veteran. I was proud of right. that. Patriotism, a very important part sure. of our South Carolina belief. Methodist, that was my religion. Native Greenvillian. To me, that was very important that was really at that correct. time. Right. <laughs> now. <clears throat> there are not a whole lot of native green billions left. Uh, you still have the interest in, in spiritual things, the interest in patriotism in the country, uh, and, and now we a lot more amalgamated in terms of people. Yeah, this is a minor little detail, but do, do I remember correctly from your oral history with Jack Bass that your father counseled you against running in every race you ran in? He did, and uh, that, he was very much knowledgeable about uh, politics, and he, he wasn't too uh, interested in me taking that route. However, <clears throat> when, when President Clinton called me and offered to send my name over for the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, I called my father, who was a good trial lawyer and a real bar supporter, former president of the state bar. <clears throat> he thought I ought to do that. So no he, matter how tough it was. But you turned it. Yeah, that was <laughs> going to be one of my questions. And, you, and it happened a second time, right? Well, the second time they called me and asked me, did I want my name considered? And I said, no, I'm still into education, and that's what I want well, to do. Why? why? Why would you? I mean, it, it was toward the end of your term. I mean, you know, the Supreme Court's for life. You could have... Well, it wasn't the end of my term, really. When, when the president first called me, it was really in my second year as Secretary of Education. Right. And I had worked all year to bring in some of the best people in the country and in, into the department and had gotten the department pretty well straightened out. We still had a lot of things to do. But I was into that. I, that was a big responsibility to me. I was in the education on the state level, and here I was in the education right. on the federal level. So that, to me, was the most important thing I could be about. Later, the president asked me to, to be his chief of staff. And I turned that down for the same reason. I said, you know, I, I can help you more over here in the Department of Education than I can over there in the White House. And the second time was when they asked if you'd be considered. That was toward the end of your... That was like two years later. I was two years. Uh, it was still in the first term or the second term? It was still the first term. It was still in the first term? Mm -hmm. Second term, he wanted me to be the chief of staff. You That's when he first was elected. He called me into the White House, all the people after we had a thousand or so employees, and Clinton and Gore were going to speak to the Washington people, right. their, their people. And the announcement came over there that the president wanted to see me, and <clears throat> I went in there, and it was Bill Clinton and Hillary and Leon Panetta. Leon Panetta was the chief of staff at that time, and <clears throat> the president told me he wanted me to be his chief of staff. And I was stunned at that. It's like I was, he called me earlier to be head of his transition for personnel. I was stunned at that. But uh, I had a very good relationship with the president. We'd worked closely together on a lot of things, especially education. From the vantage point of going to Washington, moving globally and stuff, 
How did your perspective of us as South Carolinians and what we need to do, did it change or was it just confirmed? Well, <clears throat> I don't think it's, uh, it's changed. I, I've gotten a lot more interested in, uh, <clears throat> in what we're like and what people think of us as a state. Uh, I love this state. I love everything about it. Uh, I mean, I, uh, <clears throat> and I want to improve it and make it better. Um, and, and I don't like anyone to, to smile when somebody mentions South Carolina like it's some, some joke going on or something. Uh, the awful lot of people who are great thinkers, who are, believe in the state, who are good people, want to bring everybody together. And that's what the role I want to play in a small way is to help develop that for them and, and, and then move the state forward. The EIA was a major investment, if you will, long term. The Research Triangle Park in North Carolina took 20 years before it began to bear fruit, and it's stunning now. Where, where, would, you, where would you be placing those long-term bets? Where should we in South Carolina be spending time, energy, and resources with the long-term payoff? I mean, obviously education in general, but I mean, is there some, some piece of it? Is it or, or is it a larger, you know, non-political focus that we'll have? Where, where's the long-term payoff that we could invest now, in 20 years from now, we go, that was a big idea that was right? First of all, we copied uh, <clears throat> the triangle in North Carolina and started the South Carolina Research Authority uh, when I was governor. <clears throat> Claude Scarborough, who's later my senior law partner, uh, was head of the State Chamber of Commerce and, and worked closely with me to get that put in place. And it's been very successful, by the way. South Carolina has done very well. And, and you look at the Michelins and, <clears throat> and the BMWs, you know, and uh, Boeing and all of the other tremendous uh, positive right. influences that have come from industry in this state, meaningful jobs. Um, and I think we need to, to make it very clear that, that this is a very good place to do business. We've got to do more with, with those areas that are uh, kind of underserved by meaningful industry and, and, and successful uh, jobs. Uh, we talk about the car of shame up the I-95 corridor. Uh, and I'm very much involved in that area too to try to get the schools straight, to get kids where they want to stay in their community and grow their community and not as soon as they can get out and hunt for somewhere else. Uh, so we've got pockets of the state that we really do need to do some serious work in. Uh, and again, education is the key in all of those. And you say, well, what about education? I think the most important thing for us to really be centering on right now is early childhood education. Uh, the early years, even preschool. Uh, if you're going to do something about the gap and do something about those people in the state who've not had the opportunities that others have had uh, and you need a boost, now you have to do that early. You can't wait till the kid's uh, a junior in high school and say, well, you know, he's three grade levels behind, right. uh, so now we're going to do something about it. That's, that, that can happen, but that's very difficult. So my feeling is, uh, as I indicate to you, diversity, I think, is, is a key to the future of the state. I think we've got some very positive things happening in that regard. <clears throat> and then I think education has to be part of it, and early childhood education uh, right now, to me, would be the most important aspect of that. We've got a wonderful higher education system. We've got to maintain that. We've got to maintain quality public schools all across the state. That's the state's responsibility. Uh, but to move uh, careful attention, almost a movement-wise, uh, into early childhood uh, would seem to me the right way to go. Any regrets? If, what, what <clears throat> looking back, if, you, if there was something to say, you know, I really should have done that. Uh, what, 
any regret? Well, I don't think so. Uh, I, I never did make a move that I hadn't thought about. Uh, I had a very supportive wife, by the way, took you and oh, our a team and uh, every, everything that I did. It was like having a good advisor with me. She would tell me absolutely what she thought. And my children, all my family uh, have given me tremendous support. Uh, I've had tremendous support in Greenville, my home county where I grew up. And, uh, and that's always been a comforting thing to me that the folks back home always uh, seemed like a good place right. for me to end up. Right. And uh, I've been very lucky, uh, a lot of years, a lot of issues and a lot of things. And, and I don't think I can think of anything that, uh, that I have deep regrets about. A number of years ago, a couple, of, two or three years ago, I was at a, having a beer with two or three of your longest staff colleagues types. And I asked him, I said, um, I can't remember any sort of political issue that, that reflected on Dick Riley's character, that in you know, the cesspool of Washington, the, the hardball politics, it, you, you, you sort of walk through it not only with your, your sort of character intact, but never assailed, never, you know, n n nobody, nobody ever seriously questioned your sort of character, integrity, or about any kind of events. H how did you, how did you maintain that focus? H how did you, what, what sustained you in being able to, to govern and operate and deal at the highest levels of the most crazy politics and never never have that problem. That, I, from my perspective, that's the same. No, most. that's a nice, no, nice but question. It's true. But it, well, but it, but it is absolutely true. It is the hallmark of your, of your public service. Well, if I had to, uh, to pick out a reason, and I used to tell people, you know, I'm so fortunate, served eight years in Washington and all the controversy, and I stayed off the front page of the Washington Post. Absolutely, yeah. That, you know, but education didn't need to be there. We needed to be on the education page. But anyhow, <clears throat> if I had to think one thing, as I say, I had a very supportive family. So when I'd go home at night, that was a comfortable thing for me, wherever, whatever. I might be in the most controversial thing in the world, in the legislature or in the Congress or whatever. So I'd come home at night and that was comfortable and I could read and study and talk with my family or whatever. I always carefully surrounded myself with whom I thought were the most competent, caring individuals I could find. I did that as governor. I did that as secretary of education. And just about everybody I asked to come into the Department of Education and everybody I asked to come into the governor's office came because they had that same feeling that we were going to work together as a team. We weren't there for politics. We were there to try right. to do what we were supposed to do and do it well. And I think if I had to say one thing that, uh, that kind of looked after me was that I was looked after by a very competent, competent staff. <coughs> uh, say if you were a role model for someone, how would you describe yourself as being? Uh, that overwhelms me, the idea that I would be a role model for especially a young child. If then that child asked me, uh, what should I do uh, that's important <clears throat> to kind of be more like you? Again, that would overwhelm right. me, but I, I would say this, is to be active, to get involved. Uh, I don't care which party or no party. I don't care which religion or whatever. Uh, get involved on something that you think is important uh, to your state and your country and to your fellow person. And um, I think that's probably the best uh, advice I could give is not to sit back and let somebody else do it, somebody else tell you what to do, get involved, even not always as a leader, but as an involved, caring person. Envision South Carolina, world-class, globally connected. 
the uh, fall back on my father was an officer in the Navy, and we lived in Miami for four years and came back to South Carolina. And I was in like the seventh grade at Greenville Middle School, then junior high school. And the first time I ever got involved in, in a leadership way is I got involved in a declamation contest there. <clears throat> it was a big deal, the McManus Declamation Award and the places it was packed. I got into finals, the final 10. I was a young guy, didn't have a whole lot of friends back in Greenville with nine other people who were very popular, very well known or whatever. So I drew number 10. So I was gonna be the last speaker in this big event. And I sat there on the stage, and everybody was hollering for their various <laughs> friends or whatever. And I said, you know, if I'm going to do something, I've really got to give this thing a good lick. And so I <clears throat> kind of in my own mind got up and really laid this declamation out. I remember the, the, <clears throat> it was the, the first line was, I am a refugee. Uh, I really wanted to make a move on education. It was clear to me that if we were going to have a a future in this state, we had to pull out of our past, change our culture really about how we looked uh, <clears throat> at our state and looked at, our, at each other, uh, to, to really uh, take the, the community that had been discriminated against for years, uh, and, and we were doing so much better with it. One time, women were in that same uh, category. Uh, so much better over the years, but boy, we still had a long way to go. And there was still this, this lingering uh, subculture thing that we were pulling out of over the years. Uh, and, and that really ha has something to do with the makeup of the state. As I say, we're moving in the right direction. I think all of the pushing is in the right direction now. Uh, but I <clears throat> really feel uh, heavy when I think about what has happened to the black population in South Carolina, not necessarily right. Hi, I'm Phil Noble with Envision South Carolina, and we're here at the Greenville University Center uh, talking with former governor and <coughs> former secretary of education, Dick Riley, the, um, the elder statesman of our state, sure. and a, a great one at that. Um, thank you for doing this. Uh, My pleasure. Let's talk a little bit about, I mean, you grew up here, your family's been upstate forever uh, in South Carolina. When did you first begin to have some sort of consciousness about South Carolina being different or unusual or a special place? Was it when you went off in, in the service or was it earlier? What, what were the sort of early experiences that made you conscious of, of we as the people of South Carolina? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, <clears throat> I think a lot of times I get a lot of questions about, about my formative years and how I developed my involvement in leadership and so forth. <clears throat> and, and in that regard, I, I usually was about somebody who just come to this country and what all they found. And I got a little off in the middle of it, but I did on my own for a while and I got back into it. So I finished and I got this great standing ovation and I won the declamation contest. And people asked me, he said, when did you first decide to become a leader? What I said, right. I think that had something to do with it. I really felt from that on that if I really put myself into something, I could do something with it. In South Carolina, of course, uh, I grew up here in Greenville and uh, other than those years uh, with my father in Miami. Uh, then I was in the Navy for two years and, of course, in law school and so forth, and then uh, ran for the House as a very young guy in my 20s and served four years there and then 10 in the Senate. And during that period, I mean, I really got to know South Carolina pretty well. I was a reformer in the Senate. I ran for governor. was a long shot. Really went out across the state. I headed up Jimmy Carter's campaign for president, and he was selected for this state. And uh, <clears throat> I really b began to realize uh, what a wonderful state it is. It's a great size to start with. What are we about? <clears throat> Four and 4.8 million, almost five million. Uh, the geography's good. Uh, 
we got three big uh, urban areas, so South Carolina, and then we've got, they're connected to Greenwood, Spartanburg, and Columbia, Lexington, and Charleston, and North Charleston, and then these great middle-sized communities, uh, Rock Hill, and Anderson, and on around Florence, and Orangeburg, and, and so forth, Aiken, Sumter, whatever. Really is a, is a great place, and we have the small rural communities. We have like uh, almost 30% uh, African American citizens in the state. <clears throat> Education has been my big thing uh, ever since I got into then government. 